the lifespan of all your traditional conventional assets is 30, 40, 50 years, and you're going to get up every morning and watch CNBC to find out whether Apple won or lost the frickin' tax lawsuit. The first law of money says you divide the value of the asset by the maintenance cost. So something divided by 10 basis points lives a thousand years. This is the longest duration financial or longest duration asset the human race has figured out, right? We've invented. This is digital capital. About a week ago, MicroStrategy Executive Chairman and co-founder Michael Saylor delivered another highly bullish presentation on Bitcoin at the HC Wright Annual Global Investment Conference. Saylor's compelling keynote, titled The Digital Gold Rush, highlighted why Bitcoin is a game-changer for institutions and investors seeking portfolio diversification and protection against the looming threat of inflation and the continuous devaluation of fiat currencies. During his presentation, Saylor explained how Bitcoin outperforms other asset classes, including major stock indices like the San P500, gold, high-yield bonds, and other commodities. He emphasized that monetary inflation is a critical challenge every investor must overcome to preserve and grow their wealth over time. However, only a few assets manage to beat the average annual monetary inflation rate of 13.3%. Saylor also pointed out that many investors remain unaware of the connection between monetary inflation and their investments, assuming they're in good shape as long as they're seeing gains without realizing how much inflation is eroding their returns. He warned that inflation drastically shortens the lifespan of various assets, noting that weak currencies like the Turkish lira and Venezuelan bolivar last less than five years, while even the US dollar, the world's reserve currency, has a lifespan of about 14 years. While physical assets like land and art may last longer, none compare to the 1,000-year potential of Bitcoin, the largest cryptocurrency by market cap. Before we continue with the rest of the video, do check out daily 5-minute crypto newsletter with all the latest crypto and Bitcoin news. It's a fantastic analysis of on-chain crypto data and breakdowns, and the best part is it's absolutely free. They'll cover expert predictions, breakdowns of on-chain crypto data, and any breaking news you need to know, all in a nutshell. Click the first link in the description and enter your email to join over 50,000 others in becoming a better crypto investor right now. Um, if we look at uh, the performance of a bunch of assets, and this is most assets over the last 14 years, what you can see is that, you know, investing in a bunch of things don't even beat the CPI, but there are a number of things that will beat the CPI. I mean, your typical diversified portfolio, your stocks, your real estate, et cetera. But the question is, what's the real benchmark for an investor? And uh, I don't think it's the CPI. The CPI is a uh, is a very synthetic metric, which is cherry picked by a bunch of government paid economists in order to be the lowest possible measure of inflation. If uh, things get too expensive, they throw it out of the CPI. Uh, a much better measure uh, would be the monetary inflation rate or the expansion of the M2 money supply. And it turns out that the expansion of the money supply very, very closely tracks the performance of the S&P index over 100 years. And when you think about it like that, what you realize is that when you invest your money in the S&P index, you're not making money. You're just not losing money. If you were rich 100 years ago and you held a diversified portfolio of stocks, you're still rich. If you uh, bought a bunch of currency or bonds, you're poor. And uh, you can see here over the past uh, four years, um, the S&P or the, or the monetary inflation rate looks like about 13%. And... Um, not many things beat that inflation rate. It's very, very difficult. In fact, uh, if, you were, if you're beating that hurdle, you probably beat it with big tech. You beat it with uh, Apple and Amazon and Google and Facebook because the best idea in the 21st century has been buy a, buy a big tech digital monopoly like a Meta or a Microsoft, somebody that's... Um, that everybody needs, nobody can stop. And if you bought it before people understood it, you're probably doing okay. And even after they understood it, you're probably okay. But um, diversification generally is selling the winner to buy the losers. If you diversified out of Amazon, you lost. If you diversified out of Apple, you lost. If you, uh, if you diversified out of Microsoft into any of the 100,000 other business software companies, you lost. Uh, and why is that? Because in the modern era, if you can establish a digital network, which goes to a billion people, it's got such a crushing economic advantage 
that it's unlikely that anybody else is going to be able to catch up with it. And Microsoft is proving that today, so many years after it was founded. Now, the question is, what's the solution? Is Bitcoin the solution? Well, the last four years, Bitcoin's performance is 46%. It's, it's totally crushing every other asset class and every other idea. And it's definitely beating the rate of monetary inflation. This is a, a chart put up by Bitwise yesterday. This is the last 14 years of Bitcoin. As you can see, the top performing assets, the top of the chart, Bitcoin is winning the investor Super Bowl 11 out of the last 14 years. If you're paying attention, you got to wonder, like, why is it winning? And is this a gimmick? Now, the advocates of Bitcoin, such as myself, who wear orange ties, we think that Bitcoin is the first perfect money. We think Bitcoin is paradigm shift. We think Bitcoin is the singularity where science collides with economics. We think you have to rethink economics. You have to rethink capital. You have to rethink money. You have to rethink business. You have to rethink corporate finance. That's what we think. And that's why we're winning. We think it's there, there's a fundamental technology shift here. There's a fundamental paradigm shift here. And we think we're going to keep winning. We think Bitcoin is digital gold. We think it has all of the virtues of sound money, none of the vices of physical gold, which was that barbaric relic. Bitcoin skeptics often raise a variety of arguments. It's used by criminals, lacks real utility, is too volatile and unstable, is backed by nothing, or will be banned by governments or hacked by foreign actors like Russians or North Koreans. However, Michael Saylor, unfazed by these claims, has consistently debunked each one in his speeches and social media posts. As the executive chairman of MicroStrategy, Saylor acknowledges that almost everyone is against Bitcoin before they come to support it. Interestingly, despite being one of the biggest Bitcoin advocates today, Saylor himself was once a critic. Back in December 2013, he tweeted that Bitcoin's days were numbered, suggesting it would suffer the same fate as online gambling. Saylor now believes the only thing separating a Bitcoin critic from an investor, trader, or maximalist is the amount of research they do. Most people begin as skeptics, but as they dig deeper to support their arguments against Bitcoin, they often find themselves on a transformative journey, from skeptic to trader, investor, and eventually maximalist. Now, let's return to Saylor's speech. Global wealth is distributed across a lot of assets. There's $900 trillion worth of wealth here. You know, you can come up with different charts, but this is, this is a reasonable one. You could think of it as, oh, I own some real estate. I own some bonds. I own some money, I own some currency. I own some equity. I own some art. I own some gold. But the real question is, why do you own this stuff? And it's divided into two categories. You own it because it's got utility. You want to look at the art, you want to live in the building, you want to hang out in the yacht, you want to fly the aircraft. Maybe you need the, ca the currency for working capital to operate your bakery or your manufacturing plant. Maybe you have your money in coal or oil or some other feedstock. So that's one reason to have assets. And the, and the other portion of this is just long-term capital. I'm just storing value. It's a rich person that has a bunch of money and they don't know what to do with it. So they buy something, right? Whenever you hear about a billionaire that bought 16 expensive houses, you're like, well, they can only live in one. Why do they keep buying things? Well, because they think it's a better investment than just putting the money in the bank. So when you think about the world that way, you say long-term capital, store of value. Well, that's half the money in the world or half the wealth in the world, $450 trillion. Bitcoin represents the transformation of our capital from financial and physical assets to digital assets. The first law of money says L equals V divided by M. The lifespan of an asset is equal to the value of the asset divided by the maintenance cost of the asset. If you buy a $10 million yacht and you spend a million and a half dollars a year to maintain the yacht, your $10 million is gone in six years right? Your money, the useful life of the yacht is six years. You're not going to stay rich buying and investing in yachts or, you know, fill in the blank. If you buy a house in Miami Beach, you're going to pay as much in taxes as the house costs you within 20 years. It's not a store of value. When you start to apply this formula to all these assets, you can put your capital into, you realize that 
Some of them have a very short, useful life. The Argentine peso won't hold your capital more than two years, nor will the Turkish lira. The U.S. dollar might hold your capital for 10 to 15 years. You invest in stocks, maybe 25, uh, bonds, not more than 30. Uh, diversified mutual fund, the S&P index, you're still getting uh, diluted by that. So all of these financial assets have a useful life, 10, 20, 30 years. And why? Because of all these risk factors, this morning, the news is Apple gets a $14 billion tax bill. Oops. The next news is Google gets fined $2.5 billion by the EU. Oops. Torts, taxes, war, crime. Oops. Uh, maybe there's a tariff that's going to interfere with your trade. Think about all the risk factors when you're buying a financial asset. Hyperinflation. Right. Maybe maybe you suffer from a new regulation. Oh, it's just illegal to do what you do. Oops. You know, if you uh, invest in a stock and read the 10K, there's 20 pages of these risk factors. I am an expert on these risk factors. We came public in 98. Our company must have published hundreds and hundreds of pages of risk factors. So there must be hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of pages of SEC filings on risk factors. This is the dilemma of storing your capital and equity if you're an investor. So what do wealthy families do? They run to physical assets and they invest in what? Probably not yachts and Ferraris, but maybe gold or paintings or land. Land is everybody's favorite thing, but land gets taxed at 1% a year. The average property tax rate is 1.1%. And that's that means it's gone in 91 years if the property value doesn't get assessed up. When the, when the government assesses the property value up, they tax your land away from you in 30 or 40 years. You don't own it. You're renting it. Financial assets are exposed to a wide range of risks, including regulation, taxation, competition, incompetence, obsolescence, and natural disasters. Michael Saylor explains that by moving into the digital world, many of these risks can be mitigated. And there's no better way to do this than through investing in Bitcoin, the world's largest cryptocurrency by market cap and the cornerstone of the entire digital asset space. In other news, MicroStrategy has announced plans for a $700 million private offering of convertible senior notes. The company intends to use the funds to pay off existing debt and acquire more Bitcoin. This comes less than a week after Saylor revealed MicroStrategy's acquisition of 18,300 Bitcoin for $1.11 billion in a social media post. The post read, MicroStrategy has acquired 18,300 Bitcoin for approximately $1.11 billion at an average price of $64,648 per Bitcoin, achieving a Bitcoin yield of 4.4% quarter-to-date and 177% year-to-date as of September 12, 2024. We now hold 244,000 Bitcoin acquired for approximately $9.45 billion at an average price of $38,585 per Bitcoin. Saylor has consistently stated that MicroStrategy will continue to buy and hold Bitcoin for as long as possible. His bullish outlook extends far into the future, with a base case prediction of Bitcoin reaching $13 million by 2045. What are your thoughts on Saylor's presentation? For more Daily Dose crypto news, check out these two awesome videos on your screen. Click now and we will see you on the next video.